up, nerds? Before I continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, it is the first episode of Potterless in November, meaning that it is donation time. Here at Potterless, we donate $1 for every member of our team over at patreon.com slash Potterless. And at the time of recording, we have 542 patrons, meaning we are donating $542 to a charity. And this month's charity is Rain. That's the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. I figured this was fitting, seeing that we just appointed someone to the Supreme Court that definitely seemed guilty of sexual assault. Rain does a lot of great things. They created and operate the National Sexual Assault Hotline, they carry out programs to prevent sexual violence, they help survivors, and they ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. So I'm glad that we can support this charity, and no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, I think it's a good mission to make sure that sexual assault, rape, abuse, all sorts of those things can be prevented, because it's just awful, and thank you to everyone who suggested this charity to me. I got the suggestion from a bunch of different people, so I really appreciate it. Also, final announcement that this weekend I will be in Vancouver, BC for the Vancouver Podfest. I'm very excited. On Saturday, November 10th from 11 to 2, I'll be at the Vancouver Public Library Central Branch doing a whole Harry Potter discussion. I'm very excited for it. It's free, so come through. I'll be hanging out with people at that location before and after the event, and then I'm also going to do a meetup on Sunday for anyone that's unable to attend. So just make sure you're following Potterless on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. I'll be posting all the details of that. But yeah, if you're going to be in the Vancouver area, let's hang out and be friends because I'm going to be there by myself and I need stuff to do. As you know, Potterless is part of an independent audio collective called Multitude, and there's a lot of great shows on there. There's Join the Party, which is a great Dungeons and Dragons podcast. There's Waystation, which is a Lost Girl fan cast. There's my other show, Horse, which shows that basketball is fun for everybody to follow, not just sports people. And there's also Spirits, who celebrated their 100th episode two weeks ago. And I just wanted to say congratulations. Without Spirits, there would not be Potterless, and the fact that they made it to 100 episodes is amazing. So, Amanda, Julie and Eric, congratulations. If you want to get any information about all of these great shows or have us help you make your podcast dreams a reality, just go to multitude.productions. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Audible and Calm. And speaking of support, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Finn, Silja A. Christensen, Frederic Van de Ostende, Pifa Alarsen, Spencer Sova, Danny Barker, Joseph Pearson, Mitz Rayam, Katya Soberg, Nadine Kramer, Alex Murray, Lauren Little, Chanel Terblanche, Sana Nomar, Kim Lutkin, Niall Wulger, someone who made their name Bumbledore, and someone who made their name Runal Waslib. Shout out to Desiree DaCosta, who upgraded her pledge. And a shout out to Anna Siriani, Victoria Julian, and Lee Ganji Singh who all had friends make Patreon accounts as gifts to them. And a huge shout out to our newest producer level patrons, Alex Basholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Cecily Togbull, Raul Avila, Julie Stuckey, Mosin Siddiqui, and Grace Riggles. They joined the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Sadie, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Clow, Alex, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Jenna, Kieran, Luis, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Benjamin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamel, Anthony, Russell, Jenny, Dustin, Katie, Audra, Indiana, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Ross, Anne, Micah, Andrea, Nikita, Colette, Chrissy, Trina, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Love, Kesh, Shivani, Ali, Cowmage, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Jeremiah, Sarah, Jesus, Ben, Francisco, Rachel, Marcus, Zachary, Gabrielle, Jessica, Natalie, Arna, Brandy, Melody, Kristen, Jonathan, Zach, Elisa, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Jonathan, Joe, Isabel, Steve, Vivian, Samuel, Victoria, Elena, Takari, Darlene, Brenna, Jackie, Drake, James, Haley, Marino, Braden, Matthew, Taylor, Hannah, Angelina, Ash, Ross, Marie, Peter, Maria, Fonas, Natalie, Hermione, Victoria, Lee, and Can't I Potter? Who never overcook or undercook their pasta, it's always the perfect al dente. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus content, my notes, discounts on the merch, and hey, guess what? New merch is coming next week. I'm very excited about it. You can go to patreon.com slash Potterless and support the show today. But without further ado, let's get into episode 54 of Potterless, covering chapter 25 of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, guest starring Kelly Beckman. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the journey of a grown man reading a series of children's novels for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm that grown man. And we are back with Kelly Beckman for the final discussion that we'll be having about chapter 25 of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, The Seer Overheard. So, Kelly, how's it going? Hello, hello, hello. It's going good. Great. Well, I say we just kick it into gear and start talking about this chapter. The fact that Harry is going out with Ginny is of great interest to the students at Hogwarts, mostly the ladies who have decided to become with Harry Potter this year. But Harry just doesn't give a damn about gossip because he's dating Ginny freaking Weasley, 
So he doesn't really have to worry about what anybody else thinks or says. And he's very, very happy. He is. Ramilda Vane apparently asked Ginny if the rumor of Harry having a hippogriff tattoo across his chest was true. And Ginny did the amazing thing of one-upping this rumor by saying that he does have a tattoo across his chest, but it's a Hungarian horntail. When she's describing this to Harry and she tells him that she's done this, she says, quote, much more macho. Also, note here, Ginny and Romilda are roommates. Oh, Romilda is also her she's year at Gryffindor. She's a year younger than Harry. Interesting, so, yeah. 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 Wow, that's fun. That's interesting. <laughs> Very much so. Harry asks what she told Romilda that Ron has, and she says, a pygmy puff, but I didn't say where. Uh, uh, Further proving that Ginny Weasley is the best character in the books. That's a burn I can get behind right there. That's a Ginny Weasley burn that I can get behind. Because it's very silly and playful and isn't mean in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So everybody laughs. Ron scowls, saying that he can take away his permission if she wants, and Ginny scoffs, your permission, which is in the most italics that italics can be in in the books. She brings up that Ron said he prefers she date Harry over Michael or Dean anyway, and Ron has to begrudgingly agree with this statement. What Michael did she date again? Michael Corner. Oh, yeah. He was a bad loser. Yes, he was. He was a bad loser. Or, as I like to interpret it, a bad loser. He got all pissy that Ginny beat him in Quidditch, and he didn't like that because he sucks. Very glad she dumped him. So Ron says fine, as long as they don't snog in public, and Ginny calls him a filthy hypocrite, yep. which is very true, because all Ron did for about half of this book was just lick Lavender's face all across the hallways, yep. and the Great Hall, and the Common Room, and all over the place. Mm-hmm. But I do understand Ron not wanting to see his sister make out with his best friend. I can sympathize with that being a weird situation to be in. I mean, it's weird, but I don't know, here I'm like, Ron, come on. First of all, it's not in Harry or Ginny's personality to be doing that. Yeah, Ginny saves that for secret corridors, as we've learned. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And yeah, he just got done with making out with Lavender everywhere in front of everyone. Mm -hmm. So yep. Definitely a little bit of the pot calling the kettle black. Mm -hmm. Ginny's free time, unfortunately, though, is dwindling because she has her OWLs approaching. And Harry is sad about this, but still, he's just glad they're together. Still, he's in love. Yeah, of course. One day, Hermione sits down with Harry and Ron and tells Harry that she wants to talk about the so-called Half-Blood Prince. Harry, channeling every single person reading this book, says, oh no, (laughs) not again. Hermione says that she will not drop it. She has been trying to think of who would have a hobby of creating dark spells, which I think it should be pretty clear as Snape. Even if I wasn't thinking Snape at this time, like, who else would do that? We've learned that Snape was all about this in the pensive trip that he took with the Marauders and stuff. This is definitely something Snape would do. Um, there are other people who would do this kind of thing, too, though. True, but there's other clues that should stand out more, and it's how I have put together that it's Snape. Because here's what we know about the Half-Blood Prince. He's good at potions. He knows dark spells and is interested in dark magic of sorts. He likes to do that hex that James and Snape do to each other a lot. And this textbook was found in the potions classroom. Who used to teach potions? Like, there's lots of clues that they are all overlooking. These are all the clues that I have used to put together that it's Snape. I just don't understand how Hermione's doing all this research and hasn't thought about this. Why haven't they thought about it being Slughorn? Because Slughorn's not Half-Blood. Or at least I don't think he well, is. Well, actually, we have no idea. He was in Slytherin, so you could... You uh, would assume. You would assume. Or the odds are in the favor. But Snape was in Slytherin, too. Yeah, but they do know Snape is a half-blood. How do they know that? Like, Harry knows this. When Harry and Snape were doing the Legilimens, Oculimens thing, and he accidentally did the shield charm back to Snape and, like, saw into Snape's brain. Or I don't know if it was the shield charm. But Harry, during this training, saw into Snape's memory, and we saw that memory back where Snape was being an angsty teenager with his parents and he was saying something about him being a half-blood and like crying in his room about it or something. That's how I learned that he was half-blood. Huh. So at least Harry knows it. Okay, well, I don't know. We don't know what Slughorn's blood lineage is. Yes, but the other thing to consider is that if Slughorn gave him that book, that means Slughorn would have had to have brought it that year and then Slughorn would have been like, oh, you can take my old textbook, Harry. Whereas Slughorn... I believe in the scene was just grab that extra book and it seemed very much like a, oh, this book is in the potions classroom. Snape has taught potions the past few years. I'm just trying to... 
point out other options. I, for yes, totally. I understand it. I get it. I'm just surprised that Hermione, who's being so thorough, has not considered this possibility. Speaking of Slughorn, though, they mentioned that Harry has not dared to go back to retrieve his book yet and his performance mm-hmm. in potions is suffering and slughorn mm-hmm. has attributed it to his love sickness over Ginny. yep <laughs> which is very so like okay yeah a bit much and that just shows how much slughorn likes harry that he's just gonna give him a pass harry says that the half-blood prince didn't make a hobby of it Hermione asks who says it's a he Harry says we've been over this Hermione and Hermione then slams down an old newspaper with a picture of someone who is described by the narrator exactly as this oh here we get into your thing I don't like this at all and I hate it a skinny girl around 15 she was not pretty she looks simultaneously cross and sullen why is the third thing we learn about her after like her basic description and age how attractive she is I don't understand why J.K. Rowling is so obsessed with appearances it's very concerning to me. I find it very uncomfortable. Everything's got to be how hot someone is. One, I think that we discussed that Harry Potter is told as a third person limited narrative. Mm-hmm. It's told in third person, but the narrator is limited to Harry's point of view. And so teenage boys are garbage and they judge everybody based off of appearances. Yes. One. Two, J.K. Rowling uses appearance, and this is what you have a problem with, as a way to show that somebody is either evil or or inept yes and i don't like that at all i think it just sets this weird kind of tone and i'm just a big proponent of you know having diversity and stuff like that where a little kid reading the book can kind of see stuff and obviously no little kid is going to think like oh i'm an ugly kid like that's not something you really process when you're a child reading or at least i didn't but i just find it problematic that jk rowling is like well if you want to be a good wizard you got to be hot that's step one well here's what I have a problem with with her saying this is she says she was not pretty she was simultaneously cross and sullen with heavy brows and a long pallid face I think she could have left out the not pretty part because pretty first of all is a very subjective Subjective term term. Mm -hmm. beauty in the eye of the beholder and all that sure I think that this girl could be pretty to somebody and I think that probably a lot of the reasons that she's not conventionally pretty in this photo is because she looks cross and sullen. Nobody really looks beautiful when they're angry, unless you're Fleur de la Cure. Well, some people have a good angry look. Like, uh, Aubrey Plaza is always, like, grumping in Parks and Rec. I've never seen Parks and Rec. Oh, well, do you know who Aubrey Plaza is? Mm-mm. Uh, just Google a picture of her, right. and I would say most of them are her making a grumpy face. She's still a very attractive person. But, yeah, I just think that it's very silly that... Like, it just doesn't need to be in this description. If it just said, a skinny girl around 15 who looked simultaneously cross and sullen, blah, 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 sure. I just don't get why it's got to be in there. I think it was unnecessary, but I think that a possible explanation for it would be that we are seeing things mainly from Harry's point of view. And Harry is a 16-year-old boy and a little bit garbage and going to objectify people. Yeah, I, I guess that can be the justification, but it still makes me... A little uncomfortable it just seems unnecessary it's like there's there's some what book is it there's a book where oh the stand uh by stephen king which is a very long book it's a 48 hour audiobook so it's oh my goodness I've, I've been working on it for i think like two years on and off but there is part of the book it's got like rotating narrators so to speak like every chapter is told from the perspective of someone else and one of the chapters is told from the perspective of a guy who's racist. So he keeps using slur terms against people, like uses the N-word and stuff. And like, even if that is the justification, it's still very uncomfortable to read. And it's uncomfortable. I guess a Stephen King book is more for adult audiences. These are kids' books, so... I don't know that any kid is going to understand, oh, yes, well, this is told in the third person omniscient, so the only reason they're talking about appearances is because Harry is... It's, a lot of kids are going to read this book. I don't think you should put so much emphasis on how people look, and it just makes me sad. Yes, I agree. But also, in that book you were just describing, the fact that he uses the N-word and uses a lot of racial slurs is letting the reader know what kind of character he is and what kind of person he is. And by doing that... It's not just arbitrarily throwing those things in there. It's a means of characterization. But, again, that's told differently than this is. Yes, I agree (laughs) with you. I'm just trying to give some reason as to maybe why. 
Yeah, I, I understand the reason. I just, I don't know. I just think it's unnecessary. And it's always we are hearing about Sirius being attractive and Voldemort being attractive until he becomes evil and like Petunia always being described as horse face and blah, 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 yeah, blah, Yeah, why blah. did Petunia just... have to be ugly? Why couldn't Petunia be beautiful like her sister? Well, she has to be horse face because Petunia is written, like that Dursley family is specifically written against like people that picked on J.K. Rowling in school. So got to get a sick ah! burn in by making fun of them every the single book, book for seven I'll, books I'll in a row. You. <laughs> so this girl, who we must know is not pretty, is named Eileen Prince. She is captain of the Hogwarts Gobstones team, which raises a few questions for me. First, uh, there's a Gobstones team? <laughs> there used to be at least. Yeah, there's not anymore. But well, there might be. You don't know. Well, they never talk about it. Gobstones is like marbles, right? So you're telling me that the school, one of the, I don't know if you consider this a sport or if it's like the speech and debate team where it's not necessarily a sport, but each school has a team and they compete against other teams. You're telling me that people go from school to other schools or house to other house playing marbles against each other? Like, this would make way more sense if it was the wizard chess team, because that actually, chess is a intense game that takes a lot of strategic planning and thoughtfulness and lots of, you know, cunning moves and deception and stuff like that. In my understanding, gobstones is just marbles where the marbles, like, shoot pus at you when they get knocked out of the circle. Isn't that all gobstones yeah, is? I always thought they had something to do with, like, interpreting ancient ruins and stuff. But, yeah, you're, I was wrong about that. You're right. Gobstones <laughs> is just marbles. And I owned a Gobstones set when I was little. We went out and bought, like, the Harry Potter Gobstones set. And it was just marbles. Was it a sack of marbles? <laughs> it, was, it was a sack of marbles. <laughs> in, a, in an official Gobstones bag. And it cost $90 because it I was mean, Harry like, Potter. Probably something absurd. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, it, I just find it funny. If there's a Gobstones team, like, where does it stop? Like, is there a Connect Four team? <laughs> like, is there an Old Maid team? Is there a... Jenga team. Is there a hopscotch team? Is there a four square team? Is there a pogo stick team? <laughs> yeah. And not only do they have a team, but they have a captain. <laughs> so uh, uh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have a captain. <laughs> Which I was on the mathlete team in high school. Like I think that that's cooler than being on the marbles team. <laughs> you didn't play them because it wasn't fun. Right, so I've never actually played a game of marbles. I'm not sure if it is fun or not. I mean, it's less fun than playing jacks, which I I, there's, I feel like I there's really lots of better jacks games. Either. Jax is where you've got like a bouncy ball. You have to bounce, pick up as many of them as you can and then catch the ball. That's way more intense than marbles. I mean, at least at the very least. Oh, oh, this these books are written in the 90s. Why is there not wizard pogs? Why are there not gob pogs? That would be so much better. Like, check out my slammer. It's enchanted and does like crazy stuff with it. That would be so much better than wizard marbles is wizard pogs. What are we doing? This book is in the 90s. I didn't play pogs either. Okay, I mean, I didn't either. I just collected them, oh. you know, like a normal person. <laughs> I think I might have played a couple times. But I was like six when they were really big. And the whole thing with Pogs is that you were supposed to challenge someone, and then if you won, you got to keep their Pogs, which I was what? not okay it's with. Just... Yeah, that's how it worked. It was like you have the slammer, and then I think you need to make them flip over or something, and then all the ones you flip you get. That was the whole thing. And I think that's how Marbles works too, in theory, is that when you beat someone in Marbles, you get their Marbles. That's how Pokemon works in theory. You don't ever get pokemon from people in the game you don't beat them and get to keep their pokemon no like ash defeats a pokemon and then he can catch it well yeah you you get it weak and then you do it or you know you've win over the squirtle squad oh, no, they were they wanted badges that's what they were doing they were getting bad yeah you don't like when you You're beat right. a gym trainer you don't get to take it but if you ever played nba street volume 2 when you beat other teams you get to take their best player and that's how you put together an amazing roster <laughs> with people like stretch and michael jordan what if it really worked like that what if that's how it actually worked in what in like the nba yeah. it was like oh we've beaten the Cavs. lebron's on our team now that would yep. be bonkers maybe that's what the lakers did hey look at you knowing cultural know stuff something. yeah you watched me incessantly on twitter out. of course yeah. i know <laughs> at the time of recording this is the beginning of july so it was right after nba free agency i try to be very good when we hang out together in new york about not checking stuff a lot but i did have to apologize and be like kelly i'm sorry something very important basketball related happened you just like disappeared for like an hour into your phone and i was like it's something big <laughs> it was very important lebron james went to the lakers it's a big deal anyways anyway <laughs> harry potter do a horse podcast from <laughs> <on>. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, go to Horace. It's a fun little basketball podcast. If you I was... like basketball and you like Mike Schubert. Mm-hmm. If you like me and basketball and silly stories, check out Horace. If you like well-designed websites, check out Horace. <laughs> You're glad you found a way to put in your plug, too. So, yes, she's captain of the Gobstones team, which is ridiculous. I am not buying this at all. Harry is not either. I wonder if it's because he thinks she's ugly. So Harry says, no way. You think she, in big italics, was the half-blood? Oh, come on. And Hermione asks why not. It's either got to be a nickname, yes, or a name someone gave themselves, yes. It definitely sounds like a self-given nickname, which is always the worst type of nickname. And then Hermione says, or their actual name. No, definitely not that one at all. Hermione proposes that maybe her father was a wizard and her mother was a muggle, thus making her a very proud half-blood prince. Like, uh, such a stretch. Such a big stretch from Hermione Granger here. Harry's like, I can just tell she's not a girl. I know she's not a girl. And Hermione's like, is it that you don't think a girl would be clever enough? And I think Harry says the most, like, Mm -hmm. the most telling thing here. Yes. He said, how can I have hung around with you for five years and not think girls are clever? And I'm like, yeah. It's very true. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to get into it. But before we do, there's a great quote from Harry where after she puts together this father, mother, half-blood prince thing, Harry hits her with, yeah, very ingenious, Hermione, (laughs) which is great. But yes, then you're right. Harry says he can tell it's not a girl, which at first sounds scummy, but then Hermione tries to call him out on it, says, how could I not think girls are clever after seeing you? But what he clarifies he meant is that it was the way in which the half-blood prince writes. He just writes like a bloke, which I think makes sense. (laughs) Yeah, he specifically says bloke. bloke. I love when they use little British things like that, like when they tell each other to come off it and stuff. It's it's my favorite little moments. Come off it's one of my favorite ones. It's so good. Hey, come off it, Harry. Hey, come off it. Oi, come off it. Oh, what's the watcher thing? Is that a Britishism? Well, I know the answer to this, and it came up, but I think this is a great way to fit in our fun little segment of British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dottie James. As far as I'm aware, watcher is not an everyday term anymore. I believe it's a generational thing. I'm not quite sure why she put it in the books. It might be regional. The first time I came across it was in Beano comics, so Dennis the Menace used to say it a lot. So that's the reason I think it is a generational thing. But yeah, I think it is old slang for hi. This has been British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dottie James. Uh, where would we be without Dottie? But yes, it basically just means like, sup. It's the British way to say sup. So Tonks always says sup. <laughs> yeah, but says, writes like a bloke, and which I can get both in terms of either handwriting or just kind of the way in which someone writes, because the quotes that we've gotten from his inscriptions in the book, the Half-Blood Prince's inscriptions are very much to the point and direct. So it seems like kind of a boyish type thing just to be like this spell for enemies and not really describing a whole lot or drawing pretty pictures or having nice handwriting which if we're being honest it would have been nice if he had described that a little bit better than he did yes it totally would have but we do know that he has bad handwriting because ron can't read the handwriting in the book it notes that in the past and just statistically i think that boys are more likely to have bad handwriting than girls. My handwriting yes. is garbage. Worst grade I ever got in school, penmanship in kindergarten. Yes, but my mother's handwriting is abysmal and my dad's handwriting is beautiful. My mom and dad weirdly have very similar looking handwriting. Interesting. I don't know if it's like one of those things where they say, you know, when couples are together, they start to like look like each other or like act like each other. I wonder if their handwriting melded to look like each other. But yes, my Aunt Judy has garbage handwriting. When we get cards from her around the holiday season, we all gather together and we play the great Schubert family tradition game of try to figure out what Aunt Judy wrote. And you just look over the card and you're like, does that say... Does that say I love you or see you soon? Like it's very much trying to use context clues and letter shapes to guess. It's always a challenge and a fun one. So thanks, Aunt Judy, for the fun little game we get to play together. (laughs) Hermione says she's going to look more into Eileen Prince. Harry says, enjoy yourself. And she says, I will. And the first place I'll look is Old Potions Awards. And then she storms off. My prediction here is that she is going to find lots of Severus Snape in these old potions awards and then she's going to put two two together and she is going to have to break the news to harry potter that the half-blood prince is snape and he is not going to take that very well do you think he's gonna believe her if she tells him that no of course not not at all zero percent chance so then what do you think happens somehow someone's gonna find the book like i think snape 
or Dumbledore will find the actual book or Harry will get it out of the room requirement. One of those two is going to see it and then point out to Harry like, oh, that's Snape's old book or, oh, that's my old book. And then Harry is going to be upset at first and then grow to appreciate Snape a little bit more because he learned so much from Snape. Interesting. I think I think this will be the beginning of Harry not hating Snape with every fiber of his being, which we eventually have to get to since Harry names his damn kid's middle name after him. So got to get to a point where Harry likes him at some point. And I think this will be the beginning of that. Ron then says, she just never got over you outperforming her in potions. Again, Ron, such a bro. Very oh, true. it's so good. Ron backs up Harry that trying to get the book back makes sense. So just further becoming the most bro and the truest friend that he can possibly be. Jimmy Peaks then comes in with a scroll for Harry Potter from Dumbledore. Let's go. We all know what this means. It's got to be the Horcrux. So Harry starts heading to the office as fast as he can. And on his way, he hears someone struggling. And it's plot twist. Professor Trelawney sprawled out on the floor, surrounded by broken sherry bottles, which is not something that I predicted would be seen. She says that she was trying to get into the room of requirement to deposit some dot, dot, dot personal items, <laughs> which I think is fantastic. She says that there was somebody already in the room of requirement, though. She heard a male voice whooping gladly as if it was in celebration. And of course, Harry Potter thinks that this is Malfoy, but honestly, probably a good guess. He's disappointed that she couldn't find out who it was without asking. He's like, wait, don't you know who it is? Your whole thing is you're supposed to be able to see stuff and predict things. And she says, quote, that her inner eye was fixed upon matters far beyond the mundane. And Harry hits her with right, which I can only imagine was coupled with a big, 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 big eye roll. Harry says that she should tell Dumbledore and suggest that they go together because he's on his way right now. Basically, he just wants someone else to tell Dumbledore about what's going on so he can be like, look, see, Malfoy's up to something. I love Harry's selfish intentions here, but I'm not surprised that he would first think of this. That's kind of how Harry Potter rolls. Oh, yeah. I mean, Trelawney is all too ready to go with him to Dumbledore because mm -hmm. she's been trying to see Dumbledore anyway. And yes. this next little segment is another one of those Trelawney stumbles upon a correct prediction. Well, not necessarily a correct prediction, but she stumbles upon saying something that's very important. She stumbles upon a prediction that you don't know about yet. Oh, okay. Interesting. She predicts something, and it's like very just like in the background of what she's saying, but it's... Um, the exact words are used later in the book. Okay, well, I didn't write anything like that down, so I'm just going to not reread this section so that I don't get any sort of spoiler. You didn't catch it, so I won't tell you. Nope, I didn't it catch it. It's all good. I won't look back on it. We'll see what when happens. When you read that chapter, so, maybe you'll remember. I will. I'll see. I don't think you'll remember. When you read that chapter, you can go back and look. <laughs> okay, I will go back and look after I read the chapter. So she is appreciative and then tells the story of her first interview with Dumbledore. It's all the stuff we already know. But then, who? Big old plot twist. She drops the bombshell that Snape is the one who interrupted the interview and heard the prophecy. I was very wrong. I thought it was like Pettigrew in rat form. I thought you already knew this. No, 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 no. This is the first time they say it, that it's Snape. You know it got interrupted by someone that was like working for Voldemort, but I thought that it was Pettigrew because Pettigrew was his rat, you know, figuratively, but also literally. It just mentioned an interruption and that they got kicked out of the inn. Did Harry not ask who interrupted? Of course he didn't. It's Harry. He never asked oh, any important man. questions. He never does. He's Harry Potter. I wonder if Dumbledore would have told him anyway, though. Uh, I don't know. Probably not, seeing that Dumbledore has an interesting reaction when Harry breaks his news to him. So this makes me like Snape even less because Snape facilitated the death of Harry's parents. Harry, very understandably, gets super pissed, yells at Trelawney to stay there as he goes to see Dumbledore alone. Harry busts in, Dumbledore does his enter thing, and Harry wants to be really mad at Dumbledore, but Dumbledore right off the bat says, I found where I think another Horcrux is, let's go and figure it out. So Harry has this weird situation where he's really mad, but has a change of heart because it's a more important matter, but he's still really upset. It's a little bit of back and forth, but he seems as if he just kind of drops it and is much more interested in the Horcrux situation. Dumbledore says that he thinks that there is one in that cave where Voldemort terrorized those kids, which I'm very interested about because I have no idea what Voldemort did in the cave. I was asked on the spot, I believe it was with Miel, she asked, what do you think happened in those caves? And I couldn't think of anything. I literally don't know. I'm not sure if we ever actually learn it or if that's one of those J.K. Rowling things where they don't tell you what happened, kind of like the birth of Jorkins thing. Is that true? It's one of the things you don't learn? People can't see your head nod. Oh, you don't learn 
you learn about the cave and what happened in the cave on multiple instances, but you don't learn what he did to those kids in the cave. And I have always wondered, what did he do? I think it's one of the things that in an interview, J.K. Rowling said she'll never explain. That's one of the things she said she'll never explain. I just want to know. What did he do? What could he have done? He was like eight years old. What could he have done that was that terrifying? I mean, he killed a boy's rabbit. That's pretty gruesome. But altogether, not that horrible. What's your theory? My theory is J.K. Rowling couldn't think of anything good. Oh, Michael. Huh? <laughs> I mean, it's very, oh, it's really bad. I pro. it's, it's like so bad. It's like so bad. I can't tell you guys what it is. Yeah, it's Michael really bad. Schubert. I've got a girlfriend. She just goes to another school. No, she's super hot. Michael. She just goes to another school. <laughs> That's my theory, but maybe she has something in mind. But you're right. He's eight. What did he do that was so damn bad? Yeah. We talk about murdering people. What's, uh, what is worse? I don't know. I, uh, I, we could talk about, we could just laundry list things that are bad. But given that we have descriptions of lots of really bad things in the book, I mean, find it interesting that she doesn't describe that one. Did he molest them? Uh, I hope not. He was eight. Would he even be able to? I, I, I mean, I didn't get boners when I was eight. Uh, molesting comes in other forms too. Sexual harassment comes in lots of forms. But uh, I, uh, I just don't. I, uh, I don't know that the type of evil that he was at age eight was of the sexual abuse type. I guess I wouldn't put it past him, but that kind of doesn't really seem like his mo. His mo seems to be more of like power grabs and stuff. That, I mean, molestation and sexual crimes are usually about power. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Hmm. Ah. Uh, well, then maybe it's better left unsaid. Uh, that's why I was thinking, like, that's why she didn't say it. Yeah. But on the other hand, mm-hmm. like, you're right. That does not become his M.O. Sure. You don't hear about him going around committing a lot but of... But it is a power thing. You are very correct that it is a power uh, thing. Yes, it's a power thing. And it would justify why J.K. Rowling wouldn't write it in a children's book. Mm-hmm. But you are right about the fact that it doesn't become his M.O. You don't hear about him doing these kind of, like unspeakable crimes you hear Uh about him killing a lot of people torturing a lot of people yeah what he does when he tortures those people we don't know i don't feel like voldemort or tom riddle was human in the same way that other people were human so i don't know if he's ever felt sexual desire and again molestation and sexual harassment and rape are not about necessarily fulfilling a a sexual need Mm -hmm. they're usually about power but there usually is also some kind of I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. I, it just it just doesn't seem like the kind of thing that he would even consider. He just seems to be above it in terms of not not necessarily above it, like he's too good for that, but something where it's like he would want to do something. I don't know. It's not like he was ever interested in anyone. He didn't have any relationships with anybody or it's not like Snape where his whole big thing of why he's mean is he had a crush on someone. It just seems like he would be more concerned with just doing whatever he can to help him. I think always his evil acts are to, like, move along his own agenda. But when he was a kid, he was just kind of, like, figuring out the extent of his power. So maybe it was something he did as a kid and then he never did again because he was like, okay, I can do this. What else can I do? And he was still kind of, like, figuring out his stuff. Yeah. But you're right. It just just doesn't seem like something he continued to do it's not like he's got like a harem of ladies where he's just you know controlling them and doing stuff that he wants yeah or men he doesn't have a harem of anyone where he's doing like weird kind of deviant stuff in that regard basically they said that he mentally scarred the kids in some way so do you think he like did a really bad karaoke performance or something (laughs) (laughs) like he sang and i will always love you by whitney Houston, really out of key (laughs) At this point, he's eight years old. He can't do the Cruciatus Curse, which is his kind of signature MO for torturing. And that's how he's tortured people into Mm -hmm. mental oblivion before. So, like, what did he do? It could have been what we had discussed. Or, like, maybe he brutally tortured or mutilated an animal physically in front of them or he Mm -hmm. inflicted some kind of traumatizing hallucination or he forced them to do things that they they didn't want to do or like yeah that's i think that's probably more in play the other possibility is he just got them in the cave and then he just kept saying the word moist over and over again (laughs) and just say moist 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 more, that would be pretty mentally scarring. It's a gross word to hear. Maybe that's why J.K. Rowling couldn't write it. <laughs> Maybe he read them his own poetry or his screenplay for his movie that he's been working on. It's an interpretive dance or a one-man play that he forced his friends to go mm-hmm. see. With no intermission. Or he made his friends move all of his stuff up six flights of stairs. 
Mm, sounds familiar, Kelly Beckman. <laughs> <laughs> I've mentally scarred so many people. <laughs> you did rope me and your family into doing it over Fourth of July weekend. You guys decided to visit while I was moving. Either you were going to watch me do it alone or you were going to join me. <laughs> I believe you were quoted as saying, oh, the timing of your trip is so great because that's when my lease is up. <laughs> I mean, I didn't say, hey, come on July 1st. <laughs> You did give us two free bottles of wine afterwards. And some beer. And, you know, a place to sleep in New York that City. That is true. That so. is invaluable. But the, <laughs> I bought the beer and the wine was just left behind by your previous tenants. What the? What? <laughs> so you didn't even get to do the stereotypical, like, I bought a pizza, guys. <laughs> I brought bagels. I bought bagels. <laughs> that, okay, that, never mind. That was all worth it. You did bring us bagels, <laughs> they were, and they were delicious. You went to Brooklyn, which is basically like going into Mordor and back. I mean, it's pretty far. It's quite the trek. Gotta go so. on that L train, you know. <laughs> Hold on there, past Mike. I think you need to take a trip to the pharmacist and get some more chill pills, because it's time for Wingardium at Ridosa. <laughs> Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by the app Calm. Thanksgiving is coming up, and while it can be a restful time for some, it can be an anxiety-inducing time for others. Maybe you have that relative that really wants to get into a heated political debate even though no one wants to talk politics, Uncle Richard. Or maybe you are hosting Thanksgiving and you have to cook a whole bunch of food. Or maybe you're going to a Friendsgiving and you want to make sure that your potluck dish doesn't suck. You need someone by your side to help you calm down. And you know who's going to help you calm down? The app Calm. It's great. What a name. If you go to calm.com slash Potterless, you can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes so many good things. Hundreds of hours of premium programming, including guided meditations, sleep stories, something that they have called the Daily Calm, so many different things that can help you just relax and chill out. And what's great about Calm is that you can custom tailor the app to do whatever meditation that you need. If you're trying to fall asleep, if you're trying to reduce your stress, if you're trying to increase your focus, Calm is there for you. So again, go to calm.com slash Potterless at C-A-L-M dot com slash Potterless. Get 25% off a premium subscription and you can find out for yourself why Calm is the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation. And you can conquer Thanksgiving, eat your turkey, and go straight into a tryptophan-induced food coma. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Audible. Don't you just hate it when you're on public transit and there's no seats and you want to read a book, but you need your hands to hold onto the pole so that you don't fall over? Well, that's where Audible comes in because Audible takes books and puts them into audio form. It's great. You can listen to books through your ears, which is amazing. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, and if you go to audible.com slash Potterless or text Potterless to 500-500, you can get a free audiobook with the start of your 30-day free trial, you can try out a whole bunch of books. I recommend one of my favorite books that just got turned into an audiobook for Audible. It's called Basketball and Other Things by Shea Serrano. Barack Obama himself listed it as one of his favorite books from last year. It's an amazing book, whether you like basketball or not. It's just very funny and written in a very colloquial manner. It's like someone is just telling you stories rather than you reading a textbook or a history book or anything like that. It's phenomenal. I can't recommend it enough. So again, if you want that audiobook or any other audiobook so that you can have a hand free to hold you up on the transit and you can keep listening to the book when you leave and your bus subway train whatever gets to your destination just go to audible.com slash potterless or text potterless to 500 500 to get a free audiobook download with the start of your 30-day free trial So regardless of what took place in the cave, now that we haven't talked about anything relevant in this chapter for the past 20 minutes. I closed minutes. my book because we went on such a tangent. Let me open this back up. <laughs> So Dumbledore warns Harry that this trip is going to be exceedingly dangerous. Harry says, I'm coming, which, yeah, he is. Uh, Harry is still mad about this, <laughs> your face. What? <laughs> Harry's pretty excited about this, all I'm going to say. Harry is still mad about the Snape thing. Dumbledore can kind of tell something's up, asks Harry what's wrong. Harry says, nothing is wrong. And then Dumbledore says, Harry, you were never a good Occlumens, <laughs> which is so Yeah, good. but Dumbledore doesn't force himself into his brain like Snape did. This is true, but Dumbledore is a bit of a better person. A little bit. Harry can't keep it inside and just bursts out, Snape! Snape's what happened! He tells Dumbledore, whose expression remains unchanged, but narrator Harry notices that his face seems to have whitened a bit. 
After a long silence that I'm sure felt like an eternity, Dumbledore asks Harry when he found this out. Harry says, just now, and then blurts out, which I think he's very warranted to do, and you let him teach here, and he told Voldemort to go after my mom and dad, all caps. This is great. This is good. I think Harry is super warranted in saying yep. this, and it is the exact reaction that he should be having. I'm so proud of Harry Potter with this. Yeah. This is so great, because I was floored. And Dumbledore does try to support Snape here and blah, blah, blah. But you can totally understand and sympathize with Harry's frustrations here. Yeah. I mean, it would be very different. Like, Dumbledore obviously knows something about Snape that has made him trust him. Mm -hmm. And you'll learn more about Snape's story and why that reason that Dumbledore trusts him is in the next book. But even knowing that, Snape's biggest flaw is that he could just never grow up he never really was his downfall and i have no problem with dumbledore hiring someone that harry didn't like or mm -hmm. hiring somebody who had made a mistake i have no problem with that he's hired a lot of people who did a lot of crappy things and then turned around and there are a lot of people who you meet in the books who've done crappy things and turned around so i have no problem with that the biggest problem is that he never got over his past and became like a real human. So stupid. It is. And the one thing that I will have to wait and see how the books progress to see how it goes. But the fact that Dumbledore has never revealed to Harry why he trusts Snape, I don't know if him keeping this from him makes sense. And there is a reason specifically why he is doing this. And maybe I will learn that there is a good reason. But my thought here, after what we've seen happen in the past couple of books, where Harry gets really frustrated about Snape and Dumbledore has to continue to reiterate that he trusts him. Early on in the books, the first couple, it was fine because Harry just didn't like Snape because Snape was mean to him. That's fine. But when Harry starts to learn troubling things about Snape and things about Snape's past and Snape being a Death Eater and all this other stuff and Snape being the reason that Harry's parents are dead, unless there is a really good reason that Dumbledore is not telling Harry why he trusts Snape, I think Dumbledore should tell Harry exactly why he trusts Snape and tell him everything and lay it all out because now we're at a point where Harry is integral to a lot of the things that Dumbledore does and it's different on a level of principal student kind of thing. They have some overlap. I wouldn't necessarily call them peers, but they have some things where they need to be on the same page about stuff. And I think this is one of them. I think that Dumbledore should have a meeting with Harry. Where he's like, look, I know you don't like Snape and he's done a lot of bad stuff. Here's everything. And Harry's old enough now where he should be able to learn this stuff. There is a reason why he has not told him. Okay. And I actually think that the fact that Dumbledore has not told him is a very large testament to Dumbledore's character. One okay. of the few. Whether it's a good judgment call or not, it was not his judgment call to make, and he therefore, I'm talking in code because I can't tell yeah, you. Sure. But you'll find out why he doesn't tell Harry. Okay. And it's simultaneously the stupidest thing and the best part of the story. Okay. It's the stupidest thing on the person's decision who <laughs> made that decision, and it's the best part on, on Dumbledore's part. For not telling Harry. And I just, I, anyway, okay. that was very cryptic, but everybody who's listening who knows, knows what I mean. Sure. No, I appreciate it. Everyone's listening is probably giggling about it. So <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just think that at this point, Dumbledore should have been like, look, here's why I trust Nate, because how can you expect Harry to get over this? So Dumbledore is about to say Snape made a mistake and Harry hits him with, don't tell me it was a mistake, sir. He was listening at the other side of the door. Dumbledore clarifies he was still under Voldemort's employ that night and he had no idea that the boy would be Harry. Basically, what Dumbledore is saying is that he's a Death Eater. He's going to relay things to Voldemort if he had known that Voldemort was going to interpret the prophecy as I'm going to go murder James and Lily's kid. Obviously, he wouldn't have done it, but, you know, not necessarily. He obviously, he wouldn't have done it because then Harry brings up a great point where he's like, do you think he's really mad that he murdered his biggest enemy? Mm -hmm. Do you really think that he's mad about that? Yeah, exactly. So then Harry, which I love the narrator says this, Harry let out a yell of mirthless laughter, which is what I do anytime someone calls a foul against me when I play pickup basketball. I usually laugh to the gods above. I play sports very differently than you play sports. <laughs> yes. I have never said a word to anybody, any opponent on the field ever. Oh, see, I love playing those head games. I take that back once. <gasps> What was the one time? What did they do? Murder your teammate? That seems like that's what it would take for you to say something mean. I think mean. she like fouled me as a soccer. I think she like fouled me on a goal scoring opportunity. 
because I never speak to an opponent, but every now I'll look at a ref and be like, can you explain that call? Or like, I like, I don't speak to the other people because I don't want to say something. I get very competitive and I don't want to say something I don't mean. See, I get very competitive and I say lots of things I don't mean. I know. And so this girl like had done something. I turned to the ref and was like, how is that? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Like, how is that not a foul? And he was like, blah, 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 blah. And then walked away. And the girl was like, I don't know if I should say this. It's going to make me sound so say it, bad. Say it, say it, say it, say it, say it. Oh, come on. I've done a million things worse. The girl worse. was just like, it's called playing soccer. And I was like, it's called being a bitch. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, like, I felt I felt so bad about it, but I was just No, like, that's so good. She Oh, that is so good. She like pushed me in the back and I was I was so mad about it because Well, that's dangerous. That's how people get and then, hurt. And then the thing was she started talking to her friend about me. She's like, oh, "That girl, she's so easy to defend." Oh my gosh. I was just like I'm like, "Ref, how is pushing me in the back not a foul?" And he's like, "Blah blah." blah. And she's like, "It's called playing soccer." And I was like, oh, "No, it's not." Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I have said far worse things. I try not to speak when I play games because I get really competitive and I know. Well, that's partially why I let out the mirthless laughter is so if I just laugh it off, it stops me from saying things that are very mean to other people. I just kind of laugh, which gets the point across that I disagree with them without me saying anything deliberately mean. So Harry is not approving of Dumbledore's thoughts and statements here. So my thought here when I was reading this is did Snape think that it was Neville or was he not smart enough to put the prophecy together and just thought it was going to be some random I mean, boy? You're assuming that Snape knows a lot about these families. You're assuming he knows when Harry and Neville were born and you're assuming that he knows how many times his parents had fought Voldemort. You're assuming that he knows all these things. I mean, we have seen how obsessed with James and Lily Potter that Snape is. I would be absolutely shocked if he didn't know the exact time of Harry's um, birth. I would be shocked. After school, he went and joined the Death Eaters, and he lost contact with that entire side of his life. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and I guess they don't have Facebook because yeah, it's the 90s. Yeah, they don't have Facebook because <laughs> they're wizards, and it's the 90s. So, yeah, Harry claps back, as you said. He hated my dad like he hated Sirius. Haven't you noticed, Professor, how the people Snape hates tend to end up dead, which, whoa. Very real statement by Harry Potter. Wait, like, who else, though? Who else? Um, let's see. James Potter, oh, Sirius Black. Yeah. I guess that's it. I don't know if there's anyone else so, that he hates. I don't, I, I don't know who he really hated. Pettigrew and Lupin are still alive. I mean, he and Pettigrew is supposedly chummy Death Eaters. No, nah, I don't think they're chummy. I think he still doesn't like him because he was a marauder for a long time. Probably so. And then he became Voldemort's, like, right-hand rat. <laughs> Dumbledore says Snape felt great remorse when he realized how Voldemort interpreted the prophecy. He believes it to be the biggest regret of his life, and Dumbledore thinks it's the reason that Snape came back to the school. So I find this very interesting. I'm assuming this whole situation was the change of heart, but I'm still not a big Snape fan. Nobody should be. Yeah, no one should. Anyone who is, I am confused by your reasoning. I say this while I have my... My always mug that I'm drinking out of right now. Yeah, uh, questionable mug choice. I probably would have gone with a Ginny quote or something. It was a gift. What can I say? <laughs> I'm trying to think, what, what quote would I get on a mug? Uh, there are countless really good Dumbledore quotes. Yeah, there are, but they're like meaningful. I want one that's like mean and Pick fun. Pick a Ron one. Yeah, like a Ginny against someone one. Or I could get one, you know how like all those kids, before they like eat their meals in the cafeteria, they always say wizard on really loudly? <laughs> I could get one that says that. <laughs> Ha ha! I love when people think that that's true and that they just missed it in the books. It's my favorite thing in the world. You could get a Can't I Potter. That would be very good. Can't I? Oh, it's so beautiful. How does anyone hate Voldemort? Harry again questions Snape's loyalty. He says he thinks Malfoy and Snape are up to something and Dumbledore, much like someone that is in a constant reoccurring fight with a significant other, says, we have discussed this, Harry, like they're a grumpy married couple. Dumbledore asks Harry what he thinks exactly they are up to, and Harry can only say, I, dot, 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 they're up to something, which, nice. You nailed it, Harry. Absolutely nailed it. He doesn't know what he's up to. Yes, but he's very sure that they're up to something. You'll find out. I do think Malfoy is guilty, but I don't think Snape is involved. I do think Snape was trying to trick Malfoy into telling him what was up, but we will find out. You'll find out. Harry starts rambling and rambling. Dumbledore says enough and informs Harry that he puts protection on the school in his absence and tonight is no different. So basically kind of telling Harry, I've got this, you know, I'm Dumbledore. Have you read the other books? 
Dumbledore says the one condition for Harry to join on this mission to get the Horcrux is that Harry must obey Dumbledore's every command immediately. This is a great thing where it's very reminiscent of when Harry was trying to go through all of the things with creatures so he couldn't find a loophole where he asks Harry, if I tell you to duck, will you duck? If I tell you not to fight back, will you not fight back? But he ends it with a really real request, which is if I ask you to leave me behind for you to leave and save yourself, will you go as well? And then after a pause, Harry says yes. So that's pretty real. Yeah. And that's something that would be really hard to do. Pretty foreboding about kind of a uh, situation they're about to get themselves into. Yeah, the fact that Dumbledore felt the need to clarify that makes me think this is going to be some uh, serious stuff. So Dumbledore sends Harry to get his cloak, and Harry does. And when he goes up to the Gryffindor Tower, he runs by Ron and Hermione. And he tells them to take the Marauder's Map and the Felix Felicis and see what Malfoy is up to. When he gives the Felix Felicis, it's great because he has it kept in old socks. So he gives it to Ron. He's like, Ron, I want you to take this. And Ron's like, uh, thanks, Harry, but I don't think I need socks. And Harry's like, uh, right, and takes it out. It's a really fun moment. I think that this strategy, whether or not it is far-fetched that Malfoy is guilty or up to something, which I personally think he is, but even if it was just a shot in the dark, they don't have any other leads for anyone else. So I think that it's pretty safe for Harry, given this whole hearing the laughter in the room of requirement thing, to tell his friends, hey, regardless of if it's a long shot or not, you should check this out because it's the only possibility we've considered, so you might as well just look at this map every now and then. If you had to make a prediction as to what Malfoy's up to, <sighs> I'm going to force you to Ludo Bagman yourself here. <laughs> no, no, it's no, fine, it's fine. I'm trying to think. <gasps> oh, I know, you it. know it! I know it! How do you know it? I got it! I just got it. I just got, you got it. it. Isn't you figured oh my it out God. or you remember it from something? I just figured it out. No, I All just right, figured it out. What do you think is going on? Because... Voldemort is telling Malfoy to kill Dumbledore, and here is why. In the end of this chapter, we know that Dumbledore goes to the three broomsticks every now and then to get drinks in Hogsmeade by himself. And we know that the mead that Slughorn got was supposed to be given to Dumbledore as a Christmas present. So we have cursed necklace in the bathroom of the place that we know Dumbledore goes to in Hogsmeade, and we have cursed mead that was supposed to poison someone and it was supposed to be given from Slughorn to Dumbledore Voldemort is giving shit to Malfoy to try to murder Albus Dumbledore boom boom Boom. Does any of that have yes. to do with the Room of Requirement? Um, I don't know about the Room of Requirement like, unless there's some sort so of thing. What is he happy about right now? Like, what is Malfoy's actual plan? <sighs> I, I think the plan is to murder Dumbledore. And that's why I think, and I know that Snape murders Dumbledore, and I don't know why, but now I think I know why, because Snape made the unbreakable vow to Narcissa that he would keep Malfoy alive. If he breaks the unbreakable vow, he dies. So there's going to be some sort of showdown where they're in a circle and it's like Voldemort and Snape and Dumbledore and Malfoy. And Voldemort's basically going to have Malfoy at one point and say, I'm going to kill Malfoy unless you kill Dumbledore. And then Snape kills Dumbledore because Dumbledore is okay with well, it. Well, part of the unbreakable vow was, remember, was if Draco is unable to complete the task, will you complete it for him? And that's what's going to happen. Snape's going to kill Dumbledore. Because Snape is still going to be undercover, and that is too important and essential, so Dumbledore is going to let it happen. Boom, 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 boom. I don't know exactly what's going on with the Room of Requirement. I don't know if there's some situation where Malfoy can communicate with Voldemort in the Room of Requirement. That would be my only guess. What, what, what makes you think that Voldemort thinks Malfoy is worthy of even talking to him? Because Malfoy's much? at the school. Like, Voldemort doesn't really have people he's close with. And he doesn't reveal his plans to a lot of people. I know, but he needs someone inside the school to do it. And the only thing that you can do is get a student. He's got Snape. Yeah, but it's something where, like, Snape would be too easy. And Dumbledore knows Snape's past. So he would theoretically suspect it, where he wouldn't suspect a student to be doing these well, things. Well, you'll find out very soon. I, I think that your some of your predictions are correct. Some of your predictions have gaping holes in them. I think everything I've said is fact. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, this is going to be great. Or it'll be Luda Bagman. So some of your wider sweeping predictions are correct. Your more specific predictions, we'll see. I think I'm correct about everything to the T. <laughs> uh, D- Dumbledore says, I know that Rosmerta is involved too, and we'll get into that later. So Harry leaves them the Felix Felicis, and he stops them from interrupting him. He can tell that they're about to interrupt and protest. He says he has no time to explain. I think this is a pretty smart Aww, plan. And he didn't even have time to say goodbye to Ginny. Unfortunately, he didn't. But she was studying for Howells anyway, so she's not even going to notice he's gone. What if he dies? Nah, he's not going to die. He's got Dumbledore. Come on. And there's another book. I mean, the seventh book isn't called Other People and Ron the Weasley Deadly Hallows. It's Deadly Harry Potter. Potter. <laughs> yeah, that would be a big giveaway. Ah, ah. So Harry comes back. Dumbledore asks him to put the cloak on. The plan is to go to Hogsmeade. So it looks like they're just going to get a drink because Dumbledore does this on the frequent. He stops by the three broomsticks. They see Rose Murta kicking someone out. She does a and stay out type thing. And then they announce that they're going to the Hogshead. But instead, they apparate away. Also, we learned Trelawney, uh, you, you glazed over this, when Trelawney said she was staying at the Hogshead, mm-hmm. she said, terrible place, really. Bed bugs, you know. Oh my gosh, how are we just glossing over that? As a resident in New York City, that is my biggest fear in the world is bed bugs. That is, that is my biggest fear. It's just, oh my gosh. Well, the bigger concern is why this inn that has wizards working at it hasn't done an anti-bed bug charm. I know, or like exterminated them, or, you know, I just, I, how is that a thing? It is, oh, it's terrifying. Because wizards are dumb. Oh, I'm like itching myself now. I'm, so they say they're going to the hog's head but then instead they apparate away that's the end of the chapter but before we end the episode i have something to bring up and i think that madame rose murta is involved in some way obviously we have some sort of situation where the necklace got into the three broomsticks i don't know if the mead came from the three broomsticks but basically this is all boiling down to we've heard about this character that we didn't give a crap about for six books we're hearing about her a lot so i think she's involved it could be a situation where she's just under the imperious curse so it's not like i don't think it's anything sweeping like rose murta is evil but i think it could be something where someone does the imperious on rose murta to do their bidding or maybe a polyjuice malfoy dress up as rose murta type thing but i do think that either rose murta herself or the image and likeness of her is involved because we have not cared about madame rose murta at all and now we've heard about her three times this book separately and that is more than her average of like 0.6 so i think she's involved in this evil scheme no comment. but we will have to see of course because this is potter listening you can't spoil me but that's the end of this episode And it's the end of your guest tenure in this book, Kelly. So how do you feel about this chapter of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince? I feel good. I feel frustrated because the next one is so good. The next chapter is so hype. It's so good. I am excited to discuss it with Johnny. You got dibs on Horcrux chapter, which literally everyone wanted. I'm going to call you as soon as you read this next chapter tomorrow. Okay. And pick your brain about it. Okay. Because, oh my goodness, (laughs) the end of this book... Okay, I'm excited. I mean, I thought Horcrux was that reaction because that chapter was nuts and we talked about it for like an hour and a half. I don't know how you're going to do it with Johnny. You've got five chapters and most of them are hype. I'm very excited to get to the chapters. Uh, I'm really excited to finish up this book because it's so good. This is the best book. It's really good. It's so phenomenal. But this chapter was also really fun. And thanks for joining along, Kelly. Thank you for having me. No problem. Is there anything you want to promote? Maybe talk about the websites you do or anything like that? Um, I would like to promote promote harry potter i think it's a great book series um (laughs) i'd like to promote kittens and all cats i think they're great pets Uh uh-huh i would like to promote being environmentally conscious you haven't seen captain planet you hypocrite you hypocrite and not flushing the toilet after you pee oh no that's uh i I hate that you do that jane Good all, because she's amazing. Yes, shout out to Cindy Van Blarkham, who heard you yes. on your episode with Alex talk about how obsessed you were with Jane Goodall, and she Goodall. works for Jane Goodall. She said she, that Jane Goodall's her boss like five levels up, and sent us a little care package with Jane Goodall books and a signed poster and a I stuffed animal. It was really day. cute, and was you there. looked like you did... <laughs> You looked like a kid in a candy store who just got every Christmas present that they wanted. It's amazing. 
saying I'm holding the, the postcard with the monkey on it right now. Oh, well, thank you for promoting all of these things. But yes, Kelly, thank you so much for being on. It was a I'd joy like to, to have you on these episodes. Okay. At this point, horsehoops.com. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you want to just promote something that makes sense, if you go to multitude.productions, you can get in contact with Kelly about doing her own web design for oh, your yeah. website needs. I'm surprised you promoted <laughs> eight other things before yourself. I was just promoting the common good for the world. So yeah, if you need a good website, Kelly can get it done for you. I promote voting. Go out and vote. <laughs> All right. Anyway, L- Kelly, thanks so much for listening. <laughs> Listener or being on here. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, before they b- brush their teeth at night. Wizard on! I said it in the intro, but just in case you skipped it, new Potterless merch is coming soon. I'll make a big announcement about it next week when it's all live, but follow along on Potterless' social media so that you know exactly when that new merch comes. Potterless is created by Mike Schubert, it is hosted by Mike Schubert, it is edited by Mike Schubert, it is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Sadie Bear, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Lopu, Alex Stark, Rebecca Adamek, Frank Giotto, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Jenna Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Luis Nusak, Abita Med, Caitlin Jordan Pontolo, Benjamin Bridges, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Marie Lisa C. Keen, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivadonera, Camille Dog, Anthony Bonarigo, Russell Dunk, Jenny Nilsson, Dustin Wolin Cooch, Katie Rogers, Audra, Indiana Mercer, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Ross Ann Batamana, Micah Cole, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power, Colette Smith, Chrissy Hutton, Trina Unadcat, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Love Cash Longer, Shivani Patel, Ali Madsen, Calmage, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Amelia Krause, Sean Montag, Jeremiah E. Heard, Sarah Nink, Jesus J. Morales, Ben Silver, Francisco Bautista, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Gabrielle Medcroft, Jessica Ann, Natalie Jung, Arna Gutna Daughter, Brandy Baldonado, Melody McInnes, Kristen Chavez, Jonathan Swanny, Zach Ross Klein, Elisa Figueroa, Daisy Curtin, Sutter, Jessica Jacob, Orca Grower, Jonathan Foa, Joe Harrison, Marcus Zeller, Isabel, Steve Trelloer, Vivian Santos, Samuel Minor, Victoria Renee, Elena, Takari Arant, Arlene Ruiz, Brenna, Jackie Clear, Drake Perez, James Step, Haley Hastings, Marino, Braden Morrison, Matthew Mouster, Taylor Fulton, Hannah Shepard, Angelina Withred, Ash Prosser, Rosemary Heisa, Peter Bemis, Maria Vega, Fonas Ebner, Natalie Lozano, Hermione Hoff, Victoria Julian, Lee Ganji Singh, Alex Basholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Cecily Togbol, Raul Avila, Julie Stuckey, Mosin Sadiq, and Grace Riggles and Can't I Potter? Web design by Kelly Beckman and the music is by Bettina Campamanes. You can find Potterless at facebook.com slash Potterless, twitter.com slash Potterless Pod, instagram.com slash Potterless Podcast, and our website, PotterlessPodcast.com. All the bonus content lives at patreon.com slash Potterless. And thank you so much for listening. Until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!